nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any town council reports or correspondence tonight? Yes, yes I do. It. Yes, I just want to um, let the community know that this year, um, Councilor Lennon and Garvin and I worked to create for the community two community forums, and um, the first of which was in June, and uh, our next one is going to be Monday, September 19th, um, 2016, at, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Cafetorium. And the purpose is the, of the event is for town councilors to be able to reach out to citizens um, for two reasons, to obtain feedback from them and as well to encourage public participation in our 2017 goal setting process. So um, we, we're looking for everybody to give us some feedback on our goals. It will be only one piece of a multi pronged process, but what we're hoping for is for a great event with broad um, participation and representation from the community and as well from the town council. So again, mark your calendars, September 19th. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. We'll move on. Next item up, Finance Committee report. Mike, I think you're going to give us an overview. Yeah, just happy to report that the audit for uh, June 30, 2016 is nearly done. Uh, they're still waiting for confirmations through other odds and ends, but the audit process has gone well. Uh, and everyone can look forward to receiving tax bills about a week from today. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Anyone have any comments or questions for the manager? No? Great. Thanks, Mike. Our next item is citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Do we have some folks who'd like to speak tonight? Please <coughs> come right up. Give us your name, your address, and if you'd limit your remarks to about three minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Will do. Uh, my name is David Weatherby. I live at 14 Stonegate Road. Um, and uh, I'd just like to um, comment tonight on a few things related to the Beach to Beacon Road race that occurred this past weekend. Um, so good evening. I would like to start by thanking the Town Council and the Town of Cape Elizabeth for another extraordinary uh, Beach to Beacon this past weekend. Um, as the 2014 <coughs> Ralph Gould recipient and also the winner of the 2016 CEIF Alumni Award, largely resulting from my work associated with this race, um, I am here tonight for two reasons. Number one, to reemphasize the purpose of the race, and number two, to clarify some erroneous statements uh, certain, uh, which were made public in an article published by the Maine Sunday Telegram, whose intent uh, was to blemish the stellar reputation of our event. Um, the town of Cape Elizabeth is a stakeholder in this race, and it's important for you all to know and understand the event in case you have any questions. As stated in the Beach to Beacon bylaws, and this is a direct quote, the purpose of the corporation is to promote and encourage long distance running and to educate the public to its benefits <clears throat> in conjunction with this, the establishment of an annual 10 kilometer road race, end quote. Nowhere is there a charitable component mentioned in the purpose of the race, yet the race helps generate over $150,000 a year for main based charities. And I'm gonna cycle to you uh, a letter and a picture that came today from Donna Dwyer at Mind Place Teen Center. Donna was a graduate of the class of 82 in Cape Elizabeth. And she ended by saying this, thank you is not enough in this case. Please know that this incredible experience will resonate forever and that the inspiring memories will remain firmly etched. Thank you for impacting the lives of our 500 kids and thank you for allowing us to be part of your feel good spotlight. Touched indeed to the core. They raised over $50,000 from the race. In addition to that, they got tremendous exposure over the course of the weekend and leading up to it. Wow. I'd also like to point out that nonprofits are not required by federal law to give to charity. Many road races do, some don't. Um, our primary objective has always been and will continue to be to put on a world-class road race showcasing the beauty of the main coast of the running world on the same roads that Joni trained here in her formative years, and also to support the TD Charitable Foundation designated charity. We have never fallen short of our purpose in putting on one of the best road races in the world, both for elites and all the other 6,500 runners. 
This is evidenced by the race filling up in under four minutes. We do far more than put on a 10K road race. We create a complete road racing experience that leaves first time runners, legacy runners, and those in between both inspired and wanting to come back again. And none of that has to do with generating money to charity, yet we do that as well. Now, regarding the article, I'd just like to say that despite knowing our bib charity program existed, and when I say bib, that means registrations that they get associated with the race. <clears throat> despite knowing the program existed and having access to each of each of these organizations through a recent news release about the program, plus all of the beneficiary contact info on the website, the reporter made no effort to determine how much is currently raised for the program other than acknowledging deep into his story that in 2012, the race generated $134,000 for all of the past beneficiaries. In addition, there was no effort to extrapolate the amount raised through race history, including what would have been a much higher figure. Why not? I'll tell you why. It didn't fit the narrative. It's the lack of the reporter to determine the true charitable impact of the race created a false impression, and that's poor journalism. His comparison to the Falmouth Road Race is misleading at best, and I want you guys to understand this. Let's set aside that Falmouth, the race in Falmouth, Mass. is twice the size and twice as old as the race here in Cape Elizabeth. What Falmouth does, and this is their choice, they charge each of their charities $175 for their registrations, over 2,000 of them. And they count that as part of their revenue. They then flow that amount through their P&L and distribute the profits back to the charities to create the perception that they're donating the profits of the race to the charity. In fact, they give less money to the charities than they actually bring in revenues from the bibs. Beach to Beacon, on the other hand, separates the two. Okay? It's important. We do this so as not to muddy the operational P&L of the race. Beach to Beacon's approach of allowing the beneficiaries to fundraise directly with their supporters who want to run the race and then keep all of the gain over a normal cost of bib is a much cleaner approach. It keeps the dollars at the beneficiary level, doesn't run them through the race operation, and it ensures the race does not use charitable dollars in its operating budget and allows for a true accounting of the operations of the race. The reporter wanted, if the reporter wanted to create a true real dollar comparison of the two events, he should have included the charity program from Beach to Beacon into his numbers. He didn't do that. He also tried to compare our race to other races in Maine. And as you know, Beach to Beacon is a world-class event with professional athletes competing for 90,000 prize money, requires operations and infrastructure at the same level as other world race, or world-class races around the country. There's not another race in Maine with professional athletes that compete for even one-tenth of the amount of money that's offered here at Beach to Beacon. There's no comparison in Maine that even exists. <clears throat> I'd also like to point out that there's no big reveal in the article. Beach to Beacon's been filing 990 since inception, and both Joan Benoit Samuelson and Dave McGilvery have received compensations at the beginning of the event. It's ab their compensation is absolutely in line with industry standards. Again, the reporter did no research on communicating what industry standards in terms of comp compensation is. In addition to that, I would ask, what do other executive directors of nonprofits with similar revenues receive in compensation? How come nothing was mentioned about that? This is Joni and Dave's day job. It's their livelihood to host an incomparable 10K that attracts the finest world athletes to participate among thousands in our community, requires the race to work with and employ professionals with impeccable credentials and experience consistent with our purpose. This is what we do. I'm almost done. Thank the article states, quote, McGilvery, the race director, is paid a $58,000 management fee in 2014 as an on-site consultant. That's not true. Dave, Mc <coughs> Dave has not personally been paid one dime by the race. The management fee is paid to Dimsey Inc. And it's used to pay expenses directly related to the event as well as a percentage of his company's overhead. He has operating costs to running his business like any other business out there. He also states, quote, Dimsey handles logistics for races around the world, including the Boston Marathon. Dimsey received $79,697 for Beach to Beacon in 2014, end quote. Again, it's misleading. It makes it look like Dimsey nets all this money. Not true. The money goes toward expense reimbursement, equipment rental, and what we call consultant fees, and that's 40 plus people doing the hard work of all the setup, the tear down, everything along the course. 
strictly a bypass of costs in providing equipment and fees. As you can imagine, I could go on, so in summary, I'm just going to say it's poor journalism and another sad case of, quote, no good deed goes unpunished. I'll end my comments with this. Saturday was perhaps the greatest day in the history of the race and a milestone in resurgence of American distance running. Ben True won the TD Beach to Beacon right here on the roads of Cape Elizabeth, the first time in history an American has won the road race. The town of Cape Elizabeth deserves a big chunk of the credit. We thank you for being a generous host and participating in the race in so many ways. Police, fire, EMS, public works, facilities and transportation, homestays, runners, volunteers, spectators. <laughs> we hope we can continue this tremendous partnership well into the future, and we thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Was there someone else who wanted to speak? Yes, please, come right up. My name is Kate Wolf. I live at 5 Crescent View Avenue. I'd like to talk about the situation we have with Airbnbs in town. I have a neighbor who's been running an illegal Airbnb for two summers now. He's been told that he needs to comply. He hasn't even filled out any permits. I'd like to know why illegal Airbnb people who are running it are not being fined on a daily basis for every day that they're breaking the laws. It states on Airbnb's website that their hosts are required to know the town zoning laws and comply to the town zoning laws. If Cape Elizabeth requires that they have a permit and an inspection before they're running an Airbnb, there are some towns that penalize people who are doing this illegally. The, the rate that they collect from their, the people who they're renting to plus court fees. And if we're more aggressive about fining people, those fines can go toward what it costs to make people comply. I know that there's a burden, that there are a lot of Airbnbs run in this town, and that it takes some manpower to make sure this is enforced. But if the people who are running these Airbnb, Airbnbs illegally are fined, that can cover those costs of the administration. Um, it's been like a, uh, it's like a frat party next door. They, he has up to 25 people staying there with nine cars parked, and more than one party per week. Um, my understanding of the zoning laws is he can rent out one unit with a total of six people. If you count up the number of beds it states on his Airbnb listings, there's 25 people that he's renting to. I've had people at 2.30 in the morning underneath my bedroom window hollering about how many more air mattresses they're gonna haul in. And it's, it's just not right. It's gone on too long and nothing's happening. My, the late, latest I've heard is that Sean Tamir, the owner of that Airbnb, wants to try and change the zoning laws. What I want to know is why isn't he shut down now? Why isn't he being fined every day that he has people in that unit? And it's, it's like everything is slanted toward the owner of the house and not his neighbors. And it, it's just not right. And I'd like to know what the town council can do about it. Thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is the uh, um, manager's monthly report. And I mention that because I have a feeling that um, Michael may say a few words about the Beach to Beacon, and I suspect there are other council members who would like to weigh in on that as well. Um, I, I'm sorry, before you go, I didn't catch your name. Kate Wolf. Kate Wolf. Wolf. Thank you. And before you go, I was also going to ask the manager if he might respond to your specific concern, and um, particularly given that we have the short-term rentals ordinance, um, I'm not clear myself on what the answer is to your question, but I'd like to find out. Okay, thank you. Mike, do you want to respond to that, or should we I, look at I'd that as a council? I usually don't respond yep. until after citizens okay. had a full opportunity. You know, there's maybe another citizen wanted to speak. I'm not sure. Anyone else who'd like to speak? Thank you for that reminder. No? Okay. We'll move on to the um, manager's monthly report. I know that you're looking for something. Yeah, I, you know... <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you know, this is something that the code enforcement officer has been working on. Uh, you know, all I can do is read to you what 
the code enforcement officer has written, if you'd like me to do that. I, I, I'm curious Th this myself. I'd like to know. This was what he wrote to one of the other neighbors. Thank you for writing with pressure concerns. Last Monday I met with Mr. Mayor in the morning and sent him a formal notice of violation in the afternoon. This is the code officer. He does not believe he is violating the ordinance. Plans to appeal my notice of violation to the Zoning Board of Appeals. If he submits an appeal notification, most of the neighborhood will be notified of the meeting date and time. I don't know if he's appealed yet or not. Regarding the building itself, it's a legal three-unit apartment building. I've been on the property a few times, inspected one of the apartments. It was up to code. As far as smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are concerned, I have not seen anything that causes me to think this property has an elevated fire risk. And then it goes on to the uh, short-term rentals and uh, that. Uh, and, and then there was there was actually two emails. You know, it, it, it's, it's often happens, you know, the resident, I'm not going to go in, but, you know, he hasn't cooperated. And the code enforcement officer is still continuing to work it. I, you know, I was looking for the notice of violation, and quickly, I'm not able to see it here. That's okay. I didn't uh, want to put you on the spot, but I thought no, you might have an immediate response. No, but I can say that the code enforcement officer is working on it, okay. that the property owner has not been cooperative, uh, and it appears to be a violation of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Shall we move on to your monthly report? It, I'm not sure if there are any questions on that first. Any no. questions? I think, where was the property? Did you guys catch where it is? Do you know where it is? What's that? The I'm, property itself that she was complaining It's It's the, the sort of the old farmhouse as you look at the kettle cove takeout that's diagonally in the oh, okay. back there. Oh, it's like green. In Crescent View. Yeah, okay. Can I say one thing about yes. the Beach Beacon? I, I wasn't here, unfortunately, but have you written a letter to the editor? Were the race considering uh, what David, could you, if, if you'd like to answer her question, could you just come right back up to the microphone? I, I just think given all that you said, it makes a huge amount of sense to set the record straight publicly in the very same periodical that published what you think was uh, false information. Yeah, there's, um, there's obviously a few schools of thought on that, um, but I do expect that um, the race will, will respond um, at a minimum to its stakeholders and whether or not it even wants to uh, dignify the, the comments in the article, I'm not sure about that. That's, that's a determination that will be made by the race board. I'm just responding as a, as a winner of a, a couple of prestigious awards in town and somebody who lives here and who was president of the race from 1998 to 2013. Any other comments or questions? No. Are we ready to move on? I will say that um, the manager has given all of us on the council a wonderful new packet of information this month, the town manager's update dated August 8th, 2016. I think you'll see some of it on the website. Um, I won't see any more because I think the manager may want to say a few things himself. Just, just, th th thank you. Just very briefly, uh, for, first I'll, I'll take the Beach to Beacon first, even though it's not on my list. I just want to say that you know every indication is that the, the, the race was a, a success. Uh, we had a department head meeting this morning. We all of the different departments and they were involved with it. They said that it was uh, mishap free, no problems. A couple of people taken to the hospital, that's to be expected. Uh, but we had, and we also had 639 Cape Elizabeth runners who finished, which is not a record amount, but it's still, uh, it's, well, yeah, there's a lot, that we won't go into that. They have a lot of people <laughs> registered who were in the race, but regardless, 639, that's what, and, and, and David Weatherby thanked an awful lot about, thanked an awful lot of folks. The, 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 the two that he really didn't thank is the organizing committee that, that puts on the race. You know, mentioned volunteers, and I'm not sure you really mentioned the organizing committee, maybe you did. And the second one is we do get help from other uh, communities. Uh, other than the Cape Elizabeth Town Government, the Cape Elizabeth School Department, and I do want to thank them. If it wasn't for South Portland and Scarborough and some of the other communities who, who pitch in, we couldn't do an event of, of this size. So I do want to acknowledge them as well. Uh, other than that, I did want to mention Stella Patton passed away on July 11th. Stella was the first woman uh, to serve in the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, she was uh, a very devoted uh, person. She served three years. 
Uh, I, I was here part of the time she served. Uh, she served until 1978. Uh, but, you know, her, I also knew her, her, her husband was very involved in Rotary and actually had a, had a chance to spend about an hour and a half with her at a dinner. Uh, sat next to her about a year ago and uh, it was right after Bob had passed away. And she was doing well at that time, so it, it was very sad to see that uh, she had passed on. But she, when she was here, she, she just, there was so much going on in that period. And anyone who served on the council, the, almost all the meetings went to midnight. They were two, or three, uh, two regular meetings a month, not just one. And it was a time when people really had to give a lot of time and service. I know you all do now, but back then it was, if you think it's bad now, I, you, only they didn't have the internet to deal with. And you know, as I mentioned here, Stella had a newsletter. Uh, we report to the community that some of the other counselors didn't like. Uh, but anyway, she kept to it, she kept doing it. And uh, uh, you know, at one point there was even a parody that someone put out uh, about the newsletter. But it, it just shows there were different times, but uh, she was a great lady, a great person, and uh, well, well devoted to everything, uh, her work on the council. Uh, I did want to mention the pool is now closed. That project has begun. Uh, it's going to be closed for six or seven weeks. The filtering system uh, is going to be totally updated, and I think everyone's going to see a much nicer, and better, better feel for the pool with the air quality and, and other aspects uh, when the work is done. The Garden Club, uh, Councilor Garvin was there as well, had a great uh, forum on winter moth. Do you want, you want to add anything? Can I? Yes, please you to, do. To Jamie? Sure. Um, I was impressed at the standing room only crowd that we had in the library last Tuesday. Um, we had uh, a state entomologist and uh, our town arborist, Mike Duddy, both um, give presentations and answer questions from the audience pertaining to the winter moth infestation that's um, certainly been growing in the last few years in the area. Cape Elizabeth, uh, among the coastal communities that are most um, uh, uh, apt to be impacted. Cape Elizabeth is one of the most impacted in, in southern Maine, Cape Elizabeth, Kittery, and up in the um, Harpswell area. Um, the, the challenge before us is that there's not a really good single solution to the problem. And so if you're driving around town, particularly if you head up 77 now and certainly down near Two Lights and other areas of town, you'll see a lot of deforestation happening. And um, the various mitigation efforts uh, to help uh, arrest the problem. Um, one is one that they've done twice already, the state has through federal funding, um, released parasitic flies that the uh, winter moth worms ingest and then um, uh, die from. Uh, but then if we do any uh, 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 spraying of pesticides, then that unfortunately wipes out the parasitic flies too. So um, it's kind of a uh, catch-22 problem there. The best thing that we could ever hope for is a really, really cold winter, and several of them, uh, which would help. And, um, but uh, we haven't had many of those lately either. So in any case, going forward, the town is likely looking at some issues relating to dying trees. Um, and one of the things that um, Mike was very good to point out if you are considering planting new trees or you're doing landscaping or work like that, there are a number of trees that are not as susceptible to the winter moth problem that you should absolutely feel free to reach out to Mike as our town arborist um, to find out, well, hey, I like this kind of tree, but it's susceptible, what's a good substitute? He has a long list of those. The other thing that was of particular relevance to the garden club was that um, the movement of plants specifically if you're dividing up like hostas and irises like many of us do in our gardens, actually has the risk of transporting the, the problem around. So what happens is the, these moths, uh, the, the worms fall down to the ground after they've fed and they build their cocoons and everything in the ground. So when you actually move that plant material around, um, it, it is, you're likely causing the problem to spread. So to the degree that you can limit that, that was encouraged as well. But, in any case, it was really interesting information, and um, Mike Duddy is a great resource for us as a town arborist, and if you have questions uh, further than that, certainly direct them to him. And it was great to see our library being so well utilized for the event. I mentioned to Mike that I've heard there have now been two overflow events already mm -hmm. at the library where we didn't have a big enough room. 
I said, that's a wonderful problem to have, but I was corrected saying that's a terrible problem to have so soon in a new library. So, <laughs> look at it either way. Yeah. Anything else okay. on that, Mike? No, not on, on that, that, but no? just con uh, concluding my report, just a couple of quick things. Uh, there's also going to be a public forum uh, on the proposed amphitheater at Fort Wayne's Park. Uh, the Fort Wayne's Park Committee is holding that on August 17th at 7 p.m. Uh, and there's information about that on a website. And in the, in the same regard, the, the Community Services Committee is going to be having a forum on any input that folks want to have on the pool and fitness center. And that is at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, August 25th in the high school cafeteria. And a couple of folks have had issues with the pool and the allocation of lanes and different issues. And this is ju it's just a good time to, uh, to provide that input with other citizens being able to hear it. And uh, it's an interesting forum. Uh, then finally, Portland Headlight has a new website. I encourage everyone to look at it. It's uh, a huge improvement over the previous site. It's gorgeous. They did a beautiful job. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to weigh in on anything on this report? Yes, Jamie. Um, I would just add on the matter of the Beach to Beacon that the town of Cape Elizabeth never looks better than it does on the first Saturday in August. And all of the people that were recognized and mentioned um, deserve a tremendous amount of credit uh, for that. Uh, also, the number of spectators that come out and support the participants. Um, I ran the race again this year, and I'm constantly amazed that this town comes out in the way that it does. Um, like I said, there's, there's just no better example of uh, the quality of the community that we have here, from people that are the organizers all the way down to the people watching and, and everybody that makes it possible. And, um, like I said, as a participant, my thanks goes out to those people, and um, I, I hope that uh, they'll continue to do the great work that they do for many years to come. Thank you. Anyone else? No? I will just second that. I, I think it's a tremendous asset and a wonderful event for the community. And um, I would also like to say that um, for the town employees who have taken such great care of the park, I would just like to give them extra kudos as well. I was there on uh, around sunset later that day, and then the next morning the park was in great shape. Beautiful. So thank you for all of your hard work, and thanks to the folks on the town side too. Good. Okay, we will move on to our first uh, well, not quite our first agenda item, a review of draft minutes of the July 11, 2016 meeting. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Thank you, Patty. Is there a second? Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion of those minutes? No? All in favor? None opposed? Thank you. Now we'll move on to item number 101, 2016, Ocean House Pizza Annual License Renewal. Um, I will be looking for a motion to approve the annual renewal of Smalt and Vinus licenses. Yes, Jamie. I move that we approve the annual renewal of the Malt and Venus licenses for Ocean House Pizza. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion on that? Mike, is there anything we need to know? I've looked at, at what was in our packets. No, I didn't see anything that no, stood out. Deb does most of the leg work. Then we discussed with the department head meeting this morning and no issues. Good. Okay. Any discussion? Any questions? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? That passes unanimously. We will move on to the next item, number 102, 2016, Paper Streets. Um, I will be looking for a motion to set a public hearing on Paper Streets, and once we have a motion, we can have a little more discussion about this item. Okay, I can do that. Thank you. Um, I will move to set a public hearing for Monday, September 12, 2016, at 7 p.m. regarding recommendations for extending, discontinuing, or accepting the town's incipient rights in certain Paper Streets. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Thank you, Caitlin. Discussion, questions, comments? Any citizens discussion? Are there citizens who would like to speak to that? Please come right up. Thank you. I know the audience. <laughs> First of all, 
Hills. I live at 60 Edgewood Road, and uh, I have a, a lot that's on Stone Drive, and it abuts one of the uh, paper streets. Uh, right now, uh, it looks like it's possibly slated as a uh, pedestrian easement. Um, the issue I have with this particular lot, um, I purchased it from a couple who had owned it for about 50 years. Uh, when they bought it, it was a buildable lot. Uh, I think it's just under 8,000 square feet. With the ordinance change, um, it was rendered non-conforming, so they couldn't build on it. Uh, so if the Paper Street uh, is let go by the town, uh, that'll put me at just under 10,000 square feet. So I'm just asking that to uh, kind of consider that. Uh, I mean, I could certainly uh, agree that a pedestrian easement is needed uh, for the green belt access, et cetera. Um, quite familiar with easements. Uh, I don't know, as you all know, I uh, had to take South Portland to court on an easement on Edgewood Road. And uh, we prevailed, but it's supposed to be a private easement, actually, for two houses. But over the years, it's become a, just a regular street. And uh, I've never raised any questions about it, never asked it to be enforced or anything like that. And I never planned to. But um, it, it was quite an expense. And I'm also saddled with a turnaround easement on my existing lot, even though the road does connect now. And uh, since South Portland will not uh, remove the discontinuance, uh, uh, I'm still stuck, stuck with it. And Mike's familiar with it. We've had a discussion. So in any event, um, I just wanted to uh, kind of let you know my thought that perhaps you'd consider when you have your workshop. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. I just want to say the, the council setting the public hearing on September 12th. There were five streets that you're still going to be looking at uh, at, a, at a workshop potentially that I think will be on August 29th, although you haven't formally said that. Uh, but all, all of you said you were available that night. It's just the formality of you doing that. So, you know, anyone interested in paper streets, you know, just I want to make sure everyone's aware that there will likely be a workshop prior to September 12th at which the council could look at any of their recommendations. Can I ask my yes. question? Just procedurally, on a few of these that say council to discuss further, or however it's worded. If we make decisions on that workshop night, will we update this spreadsheet before the public hearing? We will. But we're also, you know, we need to provide public notice of this hearing. Or we will, mm -hmm. And if we do it two ways, one is with the newspaper ad. We were looking for the, the neighborhood meetings we had on this topic. We sent out 2,000 notices. So in this instance, what we're actually doing is sending out the notice of the hearing in the tax bills. Uh, so we have been saving a little over a thousand dollars by doing that. Uh, so, the, but the tax bills were reflected as of tonight and not as of post. The, the tax bills will be going out in between. So those five are listed still to be determined. Okay. Or, or you could. Okay. Or you could put a link to the website if we wanted it to be reflect the most recent. Yeah. Or we could just leave it like this and have people give us feedback. Yeah. I'm just curious well, about you know, the legality. If the council makes a. You know, makes a recommendation to the public hearing at your workshop on the 29th. Uh, we'll Assuming make sure we, we use the website, or whatever, but uh, we'll get the word out as much as we can. Yes, Pat. I just have a procedural question as well. For the public hearing, typically we might um, proceed after the public hearing that night to potentially either accept part of this report or what would be the process of procedure? We thought about how we're going to proceed through and is it road by road by road? Is it a grouping? What, how are we going to move forward after that evening? Or that evening? Um, when we have our workshop after this meeting tonight, I think we 
still need to determine what the date is for our workshop. And I think it's might be September 13th. It might be September 13th, which I think would lead to a little bit different process. But until we agree on what that date is, I'm not sure that we can, I think it's an either or. So if we had the public hearing on the 12th and we didn't have our workshop until the 13th, we would get the, which I, I, I think responds to a concern that Caitlin has often mentioned that we have a public hearing and vote on the same night. We could have a public hearing on the 12th, have our workshop on the 13th for further discussion of what we heard at the public hearing, and then move forward at the next meeting, at the next regular meeting, to have that vote. Yes? You, you know, the, your understanding is exactly as mine, and I just want to mention that the October meeting of the council at which this is likely to come up for a final vote mm -hmm. is actually not in the usual cycle of nights and it is scheduled for Wednesday, October 5th. And that's, that's the night that we're zeroing in on yep. that the decision is likely to be made on paper streams. Okay. So that's town council meeting, Wednesday the 5th? It was rescheduled. Oh, right. If it a workshop. So then, Patty, to answer your question, yeah, I think. It's going to be a multi-step process. Yeah. I, I think it should be a multi-step process. And I think that if we decide to do that, we have the opportunity to have further discussion at our workshop about how we would like to present the material and take our vote on sort of on block or group by group. You will have, with your September meeting agenda, for also everyone to see the formal draft motion that uh, Derwood Parkinson, the attorney that we've had working with us on Paper Streets issues, he will have draft motions for you to look at based on your recommendations thus far. Okay. Prior to the September 12th. Prior to the meeting. It will be with your usual course of things with your materials for your September meeting. Okay. Okay. Any I mean, other we questions have a draft on yet that? From him? We already have a draft from him, so you know it's, it won't be. We don't yet. No, I haven't seen it yet either. So mm -hmm. there, there won't be a delay in in uh, getting it to you. Okay. You'll have plenty of time. Any other discussion on this item? No. All in favor of setting the public hearing for September twelfth? Any opposed? No. Thank you, that passed unanimously. Our next item is number 103, the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Michael, would you like to introduce this? I will. Uh, one of the council goals was to establish uh, the process for a Comprehensive Planning Committee to begin to meet. This is the uh, work with Maureen and with the council chair to pre prepare a draft guide. Maureen did most of the drafting. Uh, there were a couple of changes that happened when uh, Molly and I talked about it. Uh, but this, you know, it, it, the proposal is for this to go to your workshop on uh, August 26th. Is that the date? Yeah. Okay. The, 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 the not yet scheduled one? Correct. August yeah. The proposal is that this be referred to your workshop on like to be August 26th. 29th, I think. Uh, what's the date? 29th. 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 I knew it did sound right. The 29th to review the to review this charge. Okay. So. Okay. So. Nothing is cast in stone yet. Right. Okay. So I'm looking for a motion to refer the draft charge to an upcoming town council workshop. Sarah. Uh, I move that we have um, a workshop. Have we already set the date on August 29th? We haven't set the date yet, but okay. we, we will. I move that we have a workshop to consider, to discuss and consider um, the draft charge and composition of the committee, of the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Great. Is there a second? Thank you, Patty. Any discussion on that? No? Good. All in favor? Any opposed? No, that passed unanimously. We will move on to item number 104, affordable housing relief request update. Michael, could you introduce this item? Yeah, it, on, on June 13th, the council had agreed to lift the affordable housing requirements for two moderate income restricted condominiums in the Eastern Meadows neighborhood. Uh, it, it, when, when that was done, it was based on a federal index and the, the federal indices had changed 
uh, prior to your council vote, but we hadn't picked it up. So it should have it should have provided that the maximum sale price and modicum income affordable housing instead of being three hundred ninety five thousand should have been four hundred nine thousand four fifty one. It was it was actually the the uh, the owner of the property discovered that, and he would like you to consider uh, amend, uh, doing a new action in essence. Uh, here at this meeting, <coughs> providing that it, the units could be sold to non-qualified buyers at market rates with an excess of a 409 And this is keeping with the formula that's in the existing ordinance. Thank you. Could I have a motion on the proposed language as it's written here? Thank you, Jessica. I so move. Is there a second? Thank you, Caitlin. Any discussion on that? Oh, I'm glad this was brought to our attention. Uh, anybody else have anything to say? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? <coughs> that passed unanimously. Item number 105, the proposed picnic shelter improvements. Michael, would you like to introduce this one? I, I hesitate to do this. <laughs> uh, just let me disclose that uh, I'm a member of the, the, the club that's proposing this. But, uh, the, Rotary Club in South Bolton, Cape Elizabeth provided funds back in the early 80s to, to do the community picnic shelter at Fort Williams. They also provided funds for an exercise course at the same time. In fact, it was the first time I went to a Rotary function. I, the, the then town manager, who was, I think, president of the Rotary Club, sent me to the Rotary Club to go ask for the money. Uh, so anyway, but you know, like everything it's, that's been around for a long time, it, it gets a little old and uh, needs some updating. And Tom Myers, who is a member of the board still, of you the director of community service? The director of community service of the Rotary Club. You, you here to talk about it? Is here to, you know, <laughs> you have the materials, but he's here to answer any questions and to speak for the Rotary Club on this matter. Wonderful. Would you like to come up and say a few words? Yeah, only because I drew the short straw. Um, I'm, my name is Tom Myers. I'm on Seaview, and I'm a member of the uh, uh, Rotary Club of Cape Elizabeth, or South Portland, Cape Elizabeth. And as Mike mentioned, the uh, uh, picnic shelter in that area has been a um, uh, favorite place of ours to help and continue to maintain. And this past spring, the um, town took care of some routine maintenance and painting of some of the structure. You may have noticed that it, um, some of the rusted beams inside, as well as the exterior. Uh, we. Uh, because we use it often and because we know other people use it, we notice that the area um, opposite the um, flagpole, um, that where the hot top is, everybody nod if you know where I'm talking, you know where it, um, yes. um, it just looks kind of yucky if you're having an event there as compared to the rest of the shelter with the uh, blue stone and the beautiful view. So the, our intent was, again, working with uh, uh, public works director to say what you know what kind of things you think we should do here and we had one of our members who's also a landscape architect to uh, devise a plan that was consistent with the master plan for the for the fort and we also went um, to the Fort Williams committee advisory commission committee and uh, made the similar proposal um, again based on the comp uh, on the plan of the Fort Williams and I um, we're happy that we've um, set aside we think so more than enough funding to take care of the I won't read you the proposal, but phase one, which is a blue stone, um, removing the asphalt, uh, extending the patio, and then hopefully um, have enough for phase two, which is to the area to the west, which is where the um, fire pit area is, or a piece of ledge, fire pit, um, to maybe put in some additional uh, paths as well as some landscaping so that the area is not, it just kind of gets well tro you know, mm. trod and doesn't look that nice so just again a way to make it um, enhance the, the entire area of the picnic shelter that's great thank you and could I have don't go away just wait for one minute could I have a motion uh, we have some proposed language here a motion to approve the plans and of course to thank the Rotary Club for its continuing generosity thank you could I have a motion Thank you, Jamie. I move that we accept the recommended plans uh, and grat gratefully accept the funding from the Rotary Club for this project. Wonderful. Second? Jessica. Second. 
Thank you. Discussion? Yes, Jessica. Yep. Um, Mr. Myers presented this to the Fort Williams Committee, I think it was two months ago? On June 16th. June? June meeting, yes. Yeah. And uh, it was very well received Good. by the committee members. So thank you again. Thanks. Jamie? I just had a question. I didn't see, unless I missed it, um, what your thoughts are on timing for this? I'm sorry? What your thoughts were on timing for this? Um, we're going to work with Bob uh, Malley to, f we know that um, the site is well used and there's people have scheduled events. We're hopeful uh, to get it done this fall or early spring. Again, the timing is, you know, critical for other events that are already planned there. So we, we understand that that's going to be something we have to, we'll work around. Thanks. Other comments or questions? I'll just say I thought these plans looked terrific. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. And I'm very grateful for the work that you guys are doing there, guys and women. Catherine Callahan is the one who came up with the plan just to make sure. <laughs> that I corrected yeah. that. Okay. Great. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Thank you very much. We will move on to item number 106. Council goal relating to potential new revenues. Jessica, I think this was one of your goals. Would you like to introduce this? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, this was a goal of mine and also Councillor Ray. We, they're, they're somewhat combined, I think. And, uh, but first of all, I would like to thank the town manager for all his help in pulling all these figures together and helping uh, give the report the focus that it has. Um, so uh, the goal was to look at the various revenues that we have um, uh, here in Cape Elizabeth, which include property taxes and other fees of various kinds, and to see what that picture looks like. Um, all, and in this report, you'll see that we're looking at other communities uh, nearby us and what they're doing to raise revenues. This is all um, in in light of looking at uh, the burden on the property taxpayer, as well as what the picture again looks like as in regards to what we take in and what we have to spend to keep our, our town going, looking at parks, looking at municipal side and everything else. So um, I think it's very interesting and very easy reading, I think, and I want to thank uh, Mike again for helping so much with that. So I hope the council will consider this and schedule a workshop so we can review it in depth. Wonderful. Thank you. So could I have a motion to refer this report on revenues to a future workshop? Jamie. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Patty. Discussion. Yes, Jamie. I just want to thank Jessica and Mike for I thought it was, um, I, I look forward to the entire council discussing it further, but just um, appreciate the time and effort that you both put in on it, because it was um, a lot of good detail and, and thoughtful work, so much appreciated. Anyone else? No, I would concur. Also, as you said, very easy to understand, lots of information in here on the town website, I think, mm -hmm. um, in the council packet, certainly, and probably will be elsewhere on the town website as well. Worth reading, um, very straightforward. I do have some questions on it. I look forward to the discussion at a workshop, but very well done. All in favor? Any opposed? No? <coughs> Passes unanimously. We will move on to item number 107, collective bargaining agreement with Teamsters, Local 340. Michael, would you like to introduce this? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the, we have a proposed agreement uh, with the Teamsters Local 340 who represent public works employees. Uh, it, it's a proposed two-year contract to commence on July 1, uh, 2016, retroactive of a uh, little over a month. Uh, it uh, does provide for uh, a two and a half percent increase on, on July 1 of 2016, which was the amount that was given to most all other employees, and a 2.5% increase on July 1 of 2017. It also uh, changes uh, quite a bit to, uh, that we're very pleased with, language that involves disciplinary proceedings and our ability to, to address uh, concerns and issues 
uh, through true disciplinary proceedings. Uh, there's also a change in the health insurance that uh, that uh, would stop some potential double dipping, not double dipping that's occurred, but the potential of it, particularly as we've, we've taken over community services and we, we have a larger staff base, we want to make sure that the folks can't use the buyout provision mm -hmm. while they're still getting the full insurance. Uh, so that, that's not improved. Beyond that, there's a few minor changes in allowances. The allowances have been recalculated to be on a rate per hour rather than an annual basis as a result of uh, the attorney who, who worked with us on this recommending that uh, that's the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, so anyway, we uh, I really want to thank Bob Malley uh, and Pat Dunn, who, who's the attorney who represented the town uh, in these negotiations. Uh, it was a good process. They communicated with me right throughout the, 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 the uh, bargaining, although in, in part because uh, we had these language issues that we wanted to deal with. We're very pleased to have an attorney here representing us uh, this particular time. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Could I have a motion to approve the draft two-year collective bargaining agreement with Local 340? Jessica. I so move. Thank you. Is there a <laughs> second on that? I will second that. Thank you, Patty. Discussion or questions for the manager? No, I had one quick question. Is this the first time that we had used Pat Dunn on this? For collective, we've used her for other issues in the past. Yeah. Uh, this is the first time we've used her in actual collective bargaining negotiations. We're very pleased with her. Excellent. Her help. Good. I just have a question. Yep. And Article 25, we talked about the pay increases. They have a 1, 3, 5, and 10 year anniversary um, schedule. Is that normally what is always set up that way with the collective bargaining, always to have those increments? Yes. Yes, it always is. Okay. I just haven't seen it other years. Okay. Other questions? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Michael. We will move on to item number 108, the follow-up on action at a previous meeting. And, Michael, can you give us the overview on this one? Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the items that the ordinance committee recommended along with the adoption of the ordinances that we take a look at various town documents and see what needs to be updated. That evolved into this proposed item, uh, which I initially drafted and then our attorney looked at it. He also added paragraph three, which was something that I asked him to add, but I didn't have a clue as to how to draft it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, the good news is, is that basically what, what this does, it, it indicates that everyone who's on these committees continues to serve on the committee with the new name, uh, the terms don't change. Uh, the, it addresses if, if there's uh, term limits that the time on both committees count. Uh, and then, then it says that all of the legal agreements, all of the materials or whatever, uh, we could go in and make those changes uh, simply by going and changing the name without needing to come back with, with every last little one to the council. We can, as we find them, we can do it. Wendy is. Jersey Works has already been to the website and I think has updated all the references there. So we're making progress. But this is a lot of legalese, but it's important legalese, mm -hmm. so I would encourage you to adopt this item. Thank you. Could I have a motion to accept the language that is proposed in this item? Jessica. Yep, I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Sarah. Discussion or questions for the manager on this? No? It seemed very straightforward to me. Did you have a question, Caitlin? Uh, my only question was about the shooting range ordinance. Is it clear, I mean, the shooting range, the firing range committee, because um, they're not continuing. So is it clear somewhere that those members are done and we're going to have new members assessed or assigned, or where are yeah. we in that process? You know, I, to, to, uh, I'm not sure that it is clear. Was that on our list? I know from the Ordinance Committee, we had a second page of recommendations that we wanted yeah, to and, revisit. Yeah, that is and on the list, but I think there could be some confusion with paragraph G. Uh, so, you know, I, I would, if I, I would think if, if, you know, you're the lawyer, I would have a comma with a period that's at the end of it, except for the Fire and Range, range committee, committee, which, shall be reconstituted. 
Right. Could I have a motion for that revised language? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second for that? Second. Thank you. Sarah? Is that, yes. Thank you. Discussion about that? Yes. Jessica? I just, just a point of order. Do I, do I need to agree to amend my original motion? Is that the way to proceed? I'll look to with that change amendment. rather than a well, motion. Well, I, I don't know. It depends. If I'm moving to amend it, then we vote on the amendment rather than you agreed you could just agree to amend your motion oh. so if that's what we have right we have a motion to amend it to amend right. it right. so we need to vote on no, that I, have it. I had a second you need to vote on the amendment. yes any questions on that any further discussion no all in favor of the amended language any opposed no okay so that passes so and did you catch the amended language? I did. Okay. So um, now we're back to the original motion. Any other discussion about the original motion? Yes, Sarah. I just have a quick question. Do we have a workshop, workshop scheduled to address those questions on the second page? August 29th. Thank you. Or September 13th. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions on that? On the proposed language no all in favor any opposed no that passes unanimously thank you for taking care of that michael and caitlin thank you for bringing that point up about the firing range committee item number 109 the potential citizen survey michael would you like to introduce this item yeah this is another one of the council goals i work again with uh council sullivan on this one uh we i did in fact i went the last year uh, last fall to the International City and County Managers Association Conference and visited the booth of the National Citizen Survey because I knew the council had interest in doing this. You know, we've looked at this and uh, looked at the survey that looks, you know, some of it, you know, you need to change wording a little bit here and there, but it looks very applicable to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it's, it ha has benchmarks that can, uh, you know, which is one of the goals the council had, and it looks like a good survey. Uh, Jessica and I had a discussion about whether or not to come up with some local questions, and we, we ended up hunting on that, figuring did we really want to get involved in that political uh, uh, challenge of, you know, because there's already a lot in the survey. Uh, and, you know, the council could ask questions, but suggested that, again, you refer this to a workshop uh, to look at it, see if this is a survey you want to do, uh, or if you want to head off in another direction. But, but this looks like a, it, it's a good model, uh, and uh, you can pay for as many as you want to. I put the pricing and right. all that, but you can talk about that at the workshop. Okay. Could I have a motion to refer this to a workshop? Jessica. I move that we refer this citizen survey, potential citizen survey, to a workshop. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Sarah? Thank you. Any discussion about that? I just yes. have a quick question. Sarah. Um, last time we started the comp plan, we did a pretty comprehensive survey. Would this be in place of that one, or would it be in addition to the one we might consider conducting before we embark on another comprehensive plan? You know, through, through the chair. Yes. You know, I would, you know, this is a survey that we're actually looking at, maybe doing every couple of years. I would think that you might want to do the comprehensive planning survey in an intervening year, because I think those, my sense is, those are different levels of questions in more specificity that the Comprehensive Planning Committee would probably want to have. Uh, you know, it's tough to say before they're formed, but my guess is they'll want their own questions. Mm, I think that makes sense. Yes, Jessica. Yeah, and this, this survey, if you haven't had a chance to look through it, it's, it's very broad. Um, it covers just about everything. And um, from do you feel safe in your home, to, you know, that kind of thing. And so, uh, I think this kind of thing, you know, if the council decides to do this particular survey every couple of years is, would be a fantastic um, barometer for the town. And, um, but the comp plan committee, a survey for, for that group certainly would be, I think, a lot more specific to Cape Elizabeth. Mm. Yeah. This is very broad, and yet the questions when um, Mike and I were reviewing all this and thinking about coming up with questions that are more focused on Cape Elizabeth. 
the topics on this survey, again, were so comprehensive that we didn't think in advance of a workshop with everyone going into detail that we would go down that road, because it's pretty impressive. And the, uh, not, I think, that, and just to be clear, I think there's a lot of questions in this survey that were in the last comp plan survey. Mm -hmm. So when the comp plan, you know, if they want to do a survey like they did last time, they might actually be able to have a shorter phone call and not ask as many questions because this data hmm. will also be available to them. Other questions? No? All in favor of referring the survey to a workshop? Any opposed? No? That passes unanimously. Uh, we are at the end of our list of items on the agenda. Can I just say it's 8.01. This is the earliest I think I've ever been out of a council meeting. Thank you to everyone. Um, seeing that there are no citizens left here who would like to come and speak to the council about anything that's not on the agenda, I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn and I just want to remind people that we do have a workshop on town council goals immediately after this meeting. Having said that, could I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Jamie. Is there a second? Thank you, Caitlin. All in favor? Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you.